Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer. Next to me, the uh, irrepressible Ben Glatzer. Uh Here's the deal. This guy's, this guy's a big deal. But how many of you know he's a big deal? Right? So that, that's the question that we're going to ponder today. Indeed. Where, you're a big deal, but does anybody know? We're going to cover that ground today. Because Ben is uh, basically uh, one of the premier winemaking talents on the planet. He's unfortunately based in this sleepy little country, you know, this little out there place called Australia, which, you know, starting in the early 2000s here in America, people were like, basically it was like the reverse. It was like the penal colony all over again. Mm, it was. Like basically, Australian wine was sent off to this different place, not America to kind of languish and stew in its own juices. And we, you know, we're always trying to, you know, we spent the last decade trying to figure out why, and it's a perfect tsunami. It probably will be a book at some point. Um, you can help edit. Uh, when I get old and crusty, I'll probably write it. <clears throat> but here's the deal. The Australian wines being produced by Ben Glatzer and some of his peers are in fact some of the greatest wines on the planet. Now, what we have to do is kind of reinstall this philosophy and thinking back into the American wine buying public. Mm. And the only way to do that is to tell the story and drink the effing wines, yep. right? So Ben, first a little bit of your story. Let's, um, I want the, uh, the three minute version. That would be 144 years in, in, <laughs> in three, three minutes. minutes. Well, I'm pretty okay. sure we can do that. No, right? but, but this, this is kind of, this, getting back to it, this is the kind of the idiocy of it all, yeah. is the fact that Australia has more wine growing heritage than yeah. America does. Mm. Most other New World countries for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's, um, it's great to be here. Thanks, Carl, for having me on the show. Um, yeah, I guess my, my heritage has always been involved in grape growing and, and wine making. My family uh, settled in the Barossa Valley, which is in South Australia. It's uh, probably Australia's most famous wine region. Uh, it is the second oldest wine region in Australia as well. Uh, they settled there in 1888. Uh, my father's side of the family, uh, originally from the German-Austrian border, and the Barossa Valley was actually settled by the Silesians, uh, who fled um, uh, Germany at the stage mm -hmm. and founded Barossa, which actually means Valley of the Roses. Mm -hmm. uh, and they planted vineyards, they planted orchards, they uh, raised crops and, and cattle and sheep, and became self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. So it's got a huge history in terms of the, you know, the civilization, the, um, the development of Australia as a, as a nation is, is very important in it, but it really shows what happened uh, with the history of uh, Barossa Valley. I mean, it's been emulated the way through. Um, it hasn't always been famous for making wine though, mm -hmm. um, because really in all earnest, Australian wines really only started getting exported in, let's say the six, mid 60s, mid -60s but then, yeah. then a big push in the mid 80s. Yeah. Do you know which smooth, flavoursome red is Australia's top drop internationally? where Australia really cracked into Europe mm -hmm. uh, with the original <laughs> wine flights that were called. Yeah. Uh, and it just gained more and more popularity. Yeah. The, the old vines that we do have in, in the Barossa Valley were normally used for making fortified wines. So if you're standard, uh, what were you called in those days, port and mm -hmm. uh, muskets, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why we have such old vine Shiraz, yeah. uh, old vine Grenache. Uh, both of those varieties historically were used for making Shiraz for vintage port and um, the Grenache for making a tawny port. Mm. Um, so there's huge history there, but it hasn't always been aligned into um, table wine for consumers. It was always making table wine as a seasonal production, looked just like a natural part of life. You had your oranges, mm. you had your chickens, and you had the wine from the vineyard out the back. Right, right. And uh, you know, there's still so many small land holdings that have that, that history and heritage in the Brossa. And for me, it's a pleasure to actually have access to the history of, of some of these vineyards to make what I consider to be my expression of the flavours that mm -hmm. I'm getting in the vineyards, and really to be able to get out and show the world um, the, the expression of, uh, of where I come from, sort of the essence of my origin back right. home. Right. Um, and I think really, if we talk about Australia in general going forward, we can talk about that later, but what I'm really trying to do here with the, with the Glatzer range and with the other range Heartlander that I have is really show that Australian wines can be expressive, mm -hmm. and they have to be because you know they're gonna yeah. have some richness and they're gonna have some real right. depth of flavour. But they're also, and really what I'm trying to get with, with these wines is I want that purity of fruit on the nose. I don't want to have wines that are either too vegetal because they're too green, right. even though you know, green is cool right. somewhere. And I don't want them to be too porty or stewy. They have to be wines that have good acidity, good natural fragrance, um, and also the ability to age if you want to. Right. 
But if you want to take a, like an Amon Ra, for example, super old vines, quite a concentrated wine, if we're prepared to actually sell it to our customers, mm. then you've got to be able to open it now and drink it and right. enjoy it. So balance is the key factor. And mm. Barossa Valley uh, really hands that back in space. Right. You know, the, I was going to ask you, the, 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 I, I hate to say, you know, it's almost one of the perfect places uh, to grow wine grapes, right? It, it's almost like, I feel like some of the planet is a bit jealous. Um, you have some of the native, greatest native original old vine material, yep. right? <clears throat> Clones that, uh, rootstock selections that people would die for now. And in fact, France is coming back to Australia, yep. sourcing and replanting in France, That's right. right? You have great soils, you know, sandy, lonely, limestone base, yep. friggin' mm, right? Tons of sunshine. It's, is it easy? No, it's very difficult. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's an ultimate skill in being able to do what, what right. I do. Right. <laughs> um, you're, you're, but you're a protector of these. And, and the yeah. key is to get to a place where letting people know to, that, that you're creating, you're taking this perfection, this, this opportunity, mm. and putting it in bottle yeah. and presenting it to people. Yeah. Now, some markets react differently than others. Mm. Any idea why? I think very much it's cultural. Yeah. yeah, but I like the way you encapsulate that. In that, um, essentially, that's that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm really just taking, you know, the parcels of, of flavour that we have at home in the vineyards, and and attempting to just show them around the world. Right. I mean, there is, there's a sense of artistry in that. In that, it is an expression, my expression of the flavours that I have. Right. I mean, if people talk about, you know, one of the things I hear, oh, you know, Australia, that's, oh, they're just like big and rich, and they're not terroir wines. Is that the biggest sack of hooey you ever heard in your life? Is there? I think the Barossa Valley is maybe one of the most terroir inflective regions on the planet. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, there's 16 uh, individual little regions within the Barossa Valley, you know, and literally from, from where these wines come from, which is a very small area called Ebenezer, mm -hmm. which is in the northern part of the Barossa, uh, we have uh, about 18 different soil types just on the 70 acres of vineyard that we have with um, our grape growers that mm -hmm. work with us. Um, but Ebenezer is, um, you could probably talk about the size of Burgundy, but let's say, say the Barossa Valley itself is only about 15 miles long mm -hmm. by about 12 miles wide. Okay, and we, yeah. have, we have a population of just over 20,000 people in the entire place, yeah. and it, yet it's still so famous. Ebenezer, if you want to drill that right down, which is where all the grapes for these wines come from, mm -hmm. um, is only one square mile in size. And a lot of that is still uh, pasture land and cropping land, and yep. grazing land. Um, so it's a very small section of that that are, um, are actually vineyards. And we would take, as you know, for Glatzer, we have uh, probably 90% of the grapes that come mm -hmm. off there for, for this range. Um, so to really to answer your point, it is absolutely um, a critical for me, um, knowing fully well how different, even just across the road from where we are, right. uh, into, goes into Kalimna, for example, right. which is actually a, a region as well, as well as a brand. Um, the grapes just taste completely different. Now, if we go yeah. right down south, uh, when I say that, and we're only talking 10 miles south, um, there is a more of a, a cool sort of uh, vegetal characteristic you get out of those mm -hmm. wines from Lindock, etc. Yeah. And literally from the vineyard to get to, which uh, has an elevation of basically nothing, it's like right. 24 metres, it's flat. Uh, from there to get to some of the greatest Riesling growing areas of, of Eden Valley, yeah. it'll take you 15 minutes, but you go up 500 metres in elevation. Yeah. Um, so the Barossa is just such a, a, um, a great tapestry of different um, flavours. And it's really now, I think, we're finding that a lot of winemakers, rather than just making a, <coughs> a, you know, an amorphous, this is a blend from Barossa, mm. you are seeing more and more of those little sort of sub areas coming out. This mm. is Ebenezer, or this is Lindock, or mm. you know, this is Tanunda, this is Bethany. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's great. And, and for consumers to have that opportunity to see the diversity, whether or not they're ready for it yet, it's certainly been sort of my education is, mm. uh, or attempted education, is that uh, yes, I am from the Barossa Valley. Well, initially, yes, I'm yep. from Australia. Yes, I'm from the Barossa Valley. No, the wines aren't all big, over-oaked and, and jammy. Mm -hmm. I'm also from Ebenezer, but then I'm also from this particular soil type in Ebenezer. <laughs> and that, you know, it's one of these wines. So there's a lot of aspects there that we do in Australia that uh, is just quite often it has been, um, I guess, unfairly lumped into it's just another Australian right. wine. Well, there's a feeling that you're, you're penalised simply because you're blessed with a terroir that isn't... Well, it, it, it can be marginal kind of bit of culture once in a while in its own way, based on heat. But, mm. but otherwise, you're, you're blessed with a, with, a, with a reactionary terroir, with the fact that, oh, you have to suffer. It has to be cold. Yep. You have to da-da-da-da-da. And it's like, I feel once in a while that the, the Australian wine communities have a bit penalized mm. for just being in the right place at the right time. Yep. Yeah. No, look, Does that I, sound fair? Yeah, it is. 
It's, it's, it's not Alto Adige. <laughs> you know, no, that's completely fair. But, but, I, but I think a lot of the wine trade almost wants people... I think there, it will start, there was a reactionary moment in, yep. in the mid-2000, like 2012, 2000, mm. where there was almost like this reactionary component to make, oh, we're going to rein the wines in. Mm. Mm. How do you rein in a thoroughbred? Yep. How do you tell a racehorse not to run? Yeah, yeah, right. Making lemonade out of oranges. Yep. Yeah, look, it's, it's very true. And that's, that's probably where... Um, I think the success of, of these wines has been worldwide is there's been a consistency to it. Yep. So yep. I've, I've pretty much identified the, the flavour, the structure and the balance that I, I like in wines. And that's not just me saying that arrogantly, you know, I'm making the best wine. Uh, this is me from, from working around the world, from tasting wines right around the world um, to tasting the grapes. And that's the critical part is, mm -hmm. is tasting the grapes in the vineyard and then working out what is the true expression in my eyes of that mm -hmm. uh, without manipulating too much. Right. Um, and it, it really, it comes down to that, that fact that we are blessed in, in where we're from and it is very consistent. We do have difficult vintages. 2011, yeah. for example, was yeah. a, you know, pretty much a nightmare. Um, but that was through rain, for example. And as we were talking about before um, coming on camera, um, you know, Victoria and, and parts of New South Wales uh, currently, so we're, uh, they're having huge floods and they're going to have issues leading into the 23 yeah. vintage. Um, so yes, Australia's blessed. It's a great place to live. It's relaxed. Once again, talking about population, which is what Australians do. Yeah. We only have about 23 and a half million people live in the entire continent of Australia, right. which is about the same size as North America. Right. Uh, that's about the same as uh, New York State. No, nah, unbelievable. Yeah. Let's take two minutes to talk about what I think is an archetypal Barossa wine. And, and I just enjoyed a glass of it. Actually, I might have a touch more of it. Um, the Anna Perenna, which, if, if, to me, if there's a wine that encapsulates South Australia, the Barossa Valley, classic yep. Australian winemaking. Yep. It's this wine. Yeah, absolutely. So t talk a little bit about Anna Perenna, because usually we don't talk about individual wines per se, but in this case, I think yep. it makes an important point to bring home just what is great Barossa red wine. Yeah, well, look, I mean, that's a great point. Um, I've always loved blends of Shiraz and Cabernet, mm -hmm. uh, or Cab Shiraz, you know, depending on which uh, dominant, uh, purely because some of the best wines, I think, made in the, in the 60s and 70s when Australia really started mm -hmm. um, selling wine you know, commercially. Um, they were blends of the two varieties. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you're, you're taking basically uh, a quite herbaceous, floral, um, somewhat tannic variety in Cabernet Sauvignon, and you're using also quite a pretty, rounded, and um, you know, rich style of wine, which is Shiraz. Mm -hmm. Now, to be able to make the, the, the best blend of those two, what I'm doing here is I'm using 18% Cabernet in the mm -hmm. blend. So the whole idea of this for me is that the Cabernet becomes the structure and the mm -hmm. Shiraz becomes the flesh around the outside. Yeah, right. Exactly. Because um, I wanted to have something a bit different. I mean, the Shiraz we have has its all ex a great expression, um, but I really just wanted to have a wine that had a hint of Cabernet on the nose and, and some great tannin, and that's what the blend does. It is Australia's quintessentially unique mm -hmm. blend, mm -hmm. uh, all the way from you know, all price points, all yeah. the way through. Um, and it's really accessible. There are some absolutely brilliant examples out there. Yolumba, for example, just make it some cracking yeah. Shiraz Cab blends. Yeah. Uh, this one, I think, stands pretty well. It, it's one... A uh, couple of awards at a thing called the Great Australian Red Competition, mm -hmm. which is blends of all Shiraz and Cab in Australia. Um, it's taken that out. Um, and it's, it's a wine that is my favourite in the range because it's not the most famous uh, and it's not the most affordable, but it really is an expression of what Australia can do. Basically, that, basically all the oldest Cabernet Sauvignon vines on the planet yep. are in South Australia, with a couple few exceptions, Chile, you know, you got the you got a Palta Vineyard, you got the Nyan yeah. and some of these things. But essentially, 90% of the Cabernet Sauvignon vine material over 80 years old on the planet yep. is here. Yeah, that's right. Yep. It's either here or in Langhorne Creek. So Langhorn the oldest, Creek. The oldest um, Cabernet vines in the world are actually in Langhorne Creek. Also, oh, it's not Clemens Block yep. 42. No, no. But it, it could be comparable. No. I mean, <laughs> the one thing about vines is they do have personality. The other benefit, of, I guess, is... Uh, or, or downfall is you, you, you talk to them, yeah, but uh, they don't tend to uh, give you the answers you want. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of their, their actual age, we can only rely on the records of the previous generations that have gone through. Mm -hmm. But let's say they're, they're comparable age to the oldest in the world. Then that's yeah. easier. So moving forward, I think... Um, <coughs> see, you've always done what you've done. You haven't strayed. Mm -hmm. You haven't tried to do something different. And we see all of this swirling around, like the whole top poppy syndrome and wanting yep. Amy Please in Australia. Yep. Moving forward, what's, what's your advice to some other Australian grape growers or winemakers. I mean, you can't tell people how to make their wine, but yep. can, can you at least have kind of like a, a stick to your guns moment? Because I think one of the most frustrating things as, as an American selling Australian wine in America is this whole, oh, they like Merlot, let's do some Merlot. Mm -hmm. Oh, they like this, let's, let's do this. Yeah, 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 no. Oh, they're drinking orange wine, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. right? Yep. 
what's your advice to other Australian growers? How can you help us create a scenario where there's like a consistency of Australian wine in this world? Well, I, you know, I think that's a great point. I think it's not just Australian producers. And it's a gen, it's general thing. It's worldwide. Right. There is always, and, and for some reason, the wine industry, it's, it's very prevalent. There's always this idea that if if a product, one of your particular products is not selling as well as you want, mm -hmm. then you diversify and make three. Mm -hmm. uh, by the same token, if um, something's cool in the market and uh, one of the sales guys or girls goes out to um, a retail store and they hear that Vermentino's hot or they hear that you know, Gamay's hot today, you get all these people that are trying to find you know, Gamay to make a, an Australian yeah. Gamay. Yeah. Now, some of them work really well. There's some classic examples. Right. But what happens is you get this, it's not really good diversification. You end up with yeah. all of these producers that have 20 to 25 to 30 SKUs in their yes. product range. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, where is the real essence of, of their passion in that? Right. I know that it's very much a commercial uh, decision to some extent, but rather than I think uh, chasing a market, mm -hmm. why not develop the market? Why not develop uh, where you think your product, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be just wine, it can be anywhere, mm -hmm. where you think it shows a true expression of quality of value of uh, getting customers to come back and uh, return to enjoy it again. Yeah. And that is exactly why, um, you know, with the Glatzer range, uh, right from you know, when I started back in 2000, we've only ever had four wines in yeah. the range. They're all reds. Uh, fair enough, we have access to Chardonnay, we have access to Semillon, we have access to Riesling, uh, all from really great parts of the Barossa Valley. But it's not my passion, it's not my focus. I wanted to focus on structural, balanced, um, full-bodied red wines, and that's what we do really well. So the advice would be, focus, maybe restrict a portfolio rather than increasing the portfolio, mm. because the more you make, it doesn't mean the more you're going to sell. Fair enough, you might, uh, you know. Yeah. And the more you sell, quite often when you've got a discount, the more you sell, the more you lose. Yeah. So for me, it's been it's been one of those things that, yeah, you know, fair enough, palettes go in and out of fashion all the time. So yeah. sometimes Shiraz is hot, sometimes it's not. Um, but as you've uh, seen, and I'm sure as, as your customers will see as well, these wines, yes, they are Shiraz based. Yes, they are rich in expression, mm -hmm. full of expression. They do come from the Barossa Valley. Mm -hmm. But as soon as people taste a glass of Bishop, they then think, actually, that's pretty good. Can we have another glass? They buy a bottle. Then what is the other wine they've got in the range? Then they try the Anna Perina and then right. they move up to the Amorra at the end. Um, so, yeah, that's, it's about being honest, I think, the key factor is. I'm gleefully ashamed to be drinking Australian wine. Mm. Stick to your guns, kids. Mm. If you got raw materials like this, yep. don't F with it. Yep. This is the proof's in the pudding. It's in the bottle. He knows it. I know it. Great show. Thank you. You're pretty damn good at what you do. Thanks, man. So are you. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to go to the warehouse now. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.